What's up, y'all? We're excited to be back for season three of Point Forward, the podcast. We have NBA tip-off around the corner, some news to share with the Point Forward family, and lastly, we'll touch on things happening outside the world of basketball. Let's get into it. We bike. <laughs> first things first, the Point Four family has just added a new unemployed member to the squad. Him being me, uh, <laughs> I know I, I'm, I'm no longer employed. Um, so I told y'all I ain't got no job, which means I'm retiring from basketball. I had a lot of fun, um, met some cool, interesting cats. Um, a lot to look forward to going ahead in life. But that is it for me. Uh, I will be hanging out with Lou Williams as a retired basketball player. Uh, Evan, did you have you officially retired? Yeah, I thought I did, but they were talking about signing a paper. And I'm like, that, I just told y'all I'm not coming back to work. <laughs> so you worked over. Me. That's what I'm saying. It's like, bro, is there some money with signing this? If not, no, fam. Like, y'all ain't going to hear from me. We Gucci. But if you technically don't retire, you can always be put in a trade. Man, I'm not on no raw. Ain't nobody trading. You need to get fired if you trade for me, bro. No, a trade, like sign you, then trade you. And you could take the cash because it's like salary cap money and you never show up. Brad, Stevens, throw me a lie, baby. <laughs> <laughs> sign me, throw me a lie, man, and I'll retire. Uh, I'll retire a sixer. How about that? Hmm. <laughs> Sign, trade, not show up, retire, sixer. No, somebody, that really can happen. Somebody was like, don't retire. The Warriors can throw you in a trade at the end. They could th send me back to the Sixers, and then I can get like a, I can get signed for like a, on like a five, six million dollar salary dump. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, it really can happen. Don't let me be no GM, because I'm doing that for all the homies. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, we dove into it personally, but how does it feel since the summer and everything like that? Knowing you're going to be a, you're a free man now, but, you know, diving into this new space, which is media and the Andre Iguodala enterprise. Yeah, I, I'm just as busy as ever. So I really haven't felt the effects yet. Um, it, it's kind of different. I, I'm trying to figure out how to verbalize this, but... I could use basketball as a way to push away a lot of the things that are on my plate in the past. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say push away, but my time was just heavily requested on the other side of basketball, which is where I'm, I'm diving deep into now. And so um, it was probably once I was just overwhelmed one day with just so much going on. And that was probably the, one of the few times I was like, all right, I'd rather go to practice. Like admin work isn't for basketball players. Like, you know, setting <laughs> up that iPhone and putting like nine different emails on a calendar, uh, you know, documents. Um, Following up <laughs> isn't for basketball players. Whew. Yes, that <laughs> like, part. Because it's like, I, I said it, you know, back then, it's like I said it once, get it. But now it's like double checking, triple checking and kind of, you know, uh, Get it, the real world. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, we, we got spoiled. We were very spoiled. And uh, that is, that's probably the biggest adjustments. Pretty funny, actually. You know, that follow-up thing is, is, like, I'll spend the whole day, like, all right, today is for emails. I'm talking, like, three, four hours of just doing this. But, it, 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 you know, you get some character in there. What they say, calluses create character. And so, um, that sounds so cliche. I hate saying cliche things, but... That's that's the only way you got to think about it to get over it. Most yeah, I, guys think, don't. I also hate when people try to cheer you up with some bullshit. You know, what <laughs> <laughs> they'll be like chop wood, carry water, and say, "Nah, you right, but God damn, fam, I want it now." Pause. Like, <laughs> I'm used to staying at the Ritzes and the Four Seasons and the Wardorfs, and now I'm yeah. looking at um. Why it cost so much? Or like you wish you would have <laughs> took them points. You would have stopped in and got them points and not gave them to the GM or whoever else. But you still them, right? Correct. And uh, I, I don't. The airports are really bad. 
I have to say that. Like we, yeah. we, we got to get this thing right. Like it's something with this the airport thing. Like the whole experience is, um, it's not fun at all. Point forward. Also, point forward family. We have some new partners for season three. We're partnering with SB Nation and Vox Media. And the show is brought to you by the good folks at DraftKings. ET, I have, I've been scared to the point of, um, no, I guess it was a healthy fear of the gambling thing. We've transitioned until we can embrace the sports betting, but we are, I would say I'm a, I don't even know the word. Like what's the lowest setting on NBA 2K? Novice, rookie? Beginner, <laughs> something like that. Rookie, rookie, yeah, rookie, that's it, rookie. <laughs> Yeah, so I I'm learning this whole new world of uh, gambling, gaming, betting, whatever they call it. It's like all these different words. I but I'm, so. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we don't want to BS none of any of our listeners about what we know or our expertise in the betting space. So to help us better understand the world of sports betting, particularly as it applies to the NBA. At different points over the season of point four, we're going to check in with actual and real experts. We're kicking things off with Jonathan Von Tobel. That's a hell of a name. I like it. Okay. Jonathan is a radio host and NBA sports betting expert for DraftKings Network. Jonathan, I like to call you Jay Nathan. Uh, E.T. likes to call you. Lucky white guy. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> that helps in gambling. Hey, there's there's, uh, there's quite a bit of lucky white guys out there, so I'll take it. <laughs> no lie. So, so help us understand the landscape. You know, um, I hear this word parlay so many times. Um, I'm noticing how my son watches the NFL Network for fantasy, and a team could be winning, and he's still upset that a guy didn't run in for a touchdown as opposed to kneeling. And so I got really confused. Um, I've been told on the street from time to time, Either I helped win in a fantasy or I helped lose in a fantasy. And so would love for you to share with us your 60 second breakdown of sports gaming betting. Yeah. Hey, I, I you know, I, I think sports betting is different for everybody else. For me, it, it is something where it is entertainment. There are a very few select people who bet on it professionally, who, who make it their primary source of income, but uh, I view it just like fantasy, which it should be fun. It shouldn't be something that detracts from the game. It shouldn't make you uh, take things on a personal level. If I ever walked by you guys, I would never say anything if you didn't get a final rebound right on a, a three-team parlay. But that's how I view it. You know, it is a fun ancillary thing that I think actually accentuates the game a little bit more. So when it's coming into this season now, who would you who would you most likely bet on in regards to when you're, when you're sitting here saying, let's say to win the mid-season tournament or to even mm-hmm. – you know, let's just say the championship, who would you, what are the odds? Who would you for sure bet on besides the guaranteed champions? How, how would you go about that? So when it comes to betting those sort of things, I, I think it's really important to establish like what you're doing in terms of the bet, because it's really easy to look around and go, of course, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks are the best team in the East or the Boston Celtics. So I'm going to bet on them to do that. The, the problem when it comes to betting, when you see those numbers, when you see plus 500 to win the NBA finals, th- that's a number that essentially the book is saying, we think this team has this amount of chance to win. So you as a better, when you're betting, are saying, I think they have more of a chance to win than what that number would indicate. The problem is when you look at the teams at the top, those are really, really baked into a lot of those numbers because they're going to get a lot of money. So for me as a better when you're talking about betting teams to win an NBA finals or betting teams to win the in-season tournament, this NBA cup, I'm looking for teams that I think the numbers have not caught up to yet. So for example, one of the bets that I've actually made, I did bet Cleveland to win the NBA finals. I don't think that the betters or the odds makers have factored in enough. The additions of Max Struess and George Niang, the fact that they want to run a little bit more, that they want to shoot more threes. I don't think that's been factored in enough to what the ultimate number is for them. So are they going to be underdogs to Milwaukee and Boston? Absolutely. Are they worse than Milwaukee and Boston? Yes. But when I'm betting those things, I'm saying they have a better chance than what that number is. So I think a team like Cleveland offers some value. 
I think the market hasn't really caught up to. I think the Suns are going to be very, very good. I think that they are built to dominate the regular season. They have three of the best offensive players. They did a brilliant job in adding a lot of pieces on the fringes to fill out a roster that looked like it was going to be tough to fill out because of the salary situation. And I think those are two teams that are, that are worth betting at at the current prices because I don't think that those prices represent the actual probability of them winning an NBA final. So that's how I approach it. And I think when it comes to something like the NBA uh, in-season tournament, that's really interesting because I don't think the best teams are going to be the ones that are going to win that. I think you want to look for teams that are young, teams that don't have max contracts, guys that have, are looking still for their big payday, because that's a good chunk of change for every single one of those guys to win. The motivation, I think, is going to be there a little bit more for teams like Indiana, the team at the top of my list, Orlando, that's got a good young core that I think is going to be a really big pain in the butt for anyone that they're going to run into. So I think you're looking at those two things differently, but at the very basis for me, I'm looking at those numbers and saying, I think team X has a better chance of winning than that number says. And that's why I'm betting them to win. It. Hold on. Right, keep going. Cleveland ain't never going to win. Nathan, John. <laughs> so you John, saying, I like that. John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John. So, I just wanted to make sure I heard what you said. You said Cleveland would be a team that you are looking at. Is that for the end season or for like the championship? For the championship. I've actually, I've already bet them to win the championship. Yeah. I bet them to win the NBA finals. Damn. Uh, <laughs> hey, you're a thorough dude. John. That's what, <laughs> that's going to ruin your month depending on the money. <laughs> but if you're talking about ruin your day, I have a real question. As well. <laughs> I want a real question too. Um, you think about the Bucks trade with the before the Bucks did the trade. Me and Dre always talk about. I have a great relationship with Damian Lillard, and also a great. We both have a great re relationship with Drew Holiday. After they did the point guard swap, what were the odds prior to the Bucks winning the championship and afterwards? Can you talk to us about that? Do you know that off the top of your head? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I'll take you back a little bit further. So initially, before everything started happening, Denver was the favorite to win the NBA Finals. Um, they rightfully should be. They, you know, obviously, they won it. They're the reigning champions, and nothing really had moved. After that, when you go and you get Damian Lillard from Milwaukee, Milwaukee vaulted up to the top. They became the favorites to win the NBA championship. Denver slid behind them. Boston hadn't acquired anybody. And the interesting part about this, actually, one of the biggest odds changes, the market had accounted for Miami actually going to get Damian Lillard. So Miami was at about nine to one. They fell all the way down to 28 to one. So there's all those little changes in the market that happen because the market does try to account for what is going to happen. And ultimately they got to adjust after that. So once that happens, then Boston, a couple of days later, goes and gets through holiday. They become co-favorites with the Milwaukee Bucks. So essentially a really basic timeline is Denver was favored. Then it was Milwaukee. And then now you have both Boston and Milwaukee as co-favorites to win the NBA finals. Now that that point guard swap has happened. How would you bet if I wanted to bet the rookie of the year, what would go for that favor of those type of odds? What do you think? So we actually, we've seen this. This has been pretty fascinating to watch throughout the preseason. So at one point, you know, you hear the term a lot, odds on favorite. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're at the top of the list. Odds on means that you are the, the true favorite, right? The, the minus price next to your name. And that was Victor Wembanyama for a while. He, he was actually about minus 180 or so. That would mean you bet $180 to win just 100 on him to win that award. But since we've watched the preseason and we've got to see Chet Holmgren and some of these others, Victor Wembanyama has actually fallen back to the pack. So now he's about a plus 110. He's still a favorite. But Holmgren's been the guy that has made a lot of noise. And I think if you're kind of looking around at the rookie of the year market, there's a guy like Holmgren that it's very popular because he is going to be on a team that the market really likes, the Oklahoma City Thunder. He's going to help them, right? They desperately needed a center, a defensive backstopper. He should be able to help them in that regard. Where do you uh, favor the, the Golden State Warriors to, to finish, and do they really have a real chance? Oh, I, I think they absolutely do. Right now, when you look at the betting odds, uh, they are about the third, fourth choice to win the Western Conference. You've got Denver, you've got Phoenix, and then depending on where you look, DraftKings has them right in range uh, with the Los Angeles Lakers to win the Western Conference, which makes a little bit of sense because you have to respect what Denver's done. I think they have the best starting yeah. five in the NBA. We know how good Phoenix is. So they're going to be there. And I think a lot of people know that much like how the Warriors kind of tried to handle the regular season, it seemed like last year, where it's like, hey, once we get in, we've done this before, we're going to be fine. I think that's how people approach the Golden State Warriors from a betting standpoint, too. They just kind of wait until the postseason starts. And then that money starts to come in because they know that Golden State is going to be a team that's going to be able to turn it on because they have the history of doing it. Last question on the MVP race and the bets there. How are you looking at it differently with the new rules of load management 
and how many games a player has to play or how that takes into consideration on the MVP votes. Yeah, I, I so when I talk to people and for me personally, there's not a lot of people that are changing a lot when it comes to at least MVP betting with the new awards, because we know that those guys have to play a certain amount of games. So, and there's generally like the same kind of usual suspects that are usually available and ready to go for their teams. You know, one of the, one of the guys that I bet that's been very popular too, Devin Booker, for example, you know, Booker missed quite a bit of time last year, but generally he's had a sturdier health history throughout his career than Kevin Durant since his Achilles injury, than Bradley Beal over the last two years or so. And so guy like Booker has been really popular because looks like he's going to handle the ball a little bit more. You should expect him to be a little bit more available. And he's going to be on a team that people expect to succeed when it comes to the regular season. So I haven't seen Andre that it like changes much in terms of how you view MVP. What it does change is how people view win totals. You know, you take a team like the Los Angeles Clippers, for example, this is the lowest win total that the Clippers have had in the Kawhi Leonard, Paul George era, save for the year that he tore his ACL and he wasn't available. So the win total is telling you this is the same win total for a Kawhi Leonard list team, except they have Kawhi Leonard by all accounts. So if we get more games from Kawhi because of the new rules on top of a very low win total that the market seems to be sleeping on, like that's, I think, where you're trying to factor in the rest rules and the changes in that regard, win totals as opposed to awards. And that's my dark horse to win a championship. The Clippers, right? Yes. And to be honest with you, I was just about to say, that's my dark horse is Kawhi to win MVP. Yeah. Because yep. if it's coming down to simply winning and he's playing, we always talked about this. Kawhi can guard anybody and score, you know, out 30, some of the top players on earth. And then when you sit in there, you start talking, what do you, he's won like 73% of his games. He's been in the league or something like that. But appreciate well, John, you, John. Yes, sir. We appreciate you. We look forward to chatting with you in the near future on addictions this preview was brought to you by DraftKings. the nba season starts tuesday but the nfl season is going strong and DraftKings sportsbook is hooking new customers up with an offering that's even stronger bet five bucks on any game this week to score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets and DraftKings isn't stopping there all customers can take advantage of a sweetener offer every game day this october get in on the game day greatness Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code Point Forward. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code Point Forward, only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, licensee partner Golden Nugget, Lake Charles, Louisiana. 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football for eligibility, deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. Point. Forward. Now here's the real reason all y'all are here. Andre and I sat down not only and talked about his Hall of Fame career, because <laughs> you know damn well he's about to get an orange jacket in a couple years, but we also talked about his wildest dunks, the trash talk, and the ever-changing basketball landscape that has come with his career. Not a single story went untouched. We know you'll enjoy this one. All right, so last year and a year prior to, you pined a re- retirement. What made you finally go through with it? Um, Man, th- that stuff hurts. Mm-hmm. No, I think people don't realize like what your body goes through. Even the people closest to you, like you know, the people see you every single day. People that are with you, I don't think they they don't even realize what our bodies are going through. Like we be in pain, and they just looking at us like oh, he always hurt, or you always sore, or something always. And it's like no, nah, like I need a new hip, I need two new knees, I need new wrists now. But more than anything, it's just um, I just thought it was time, you know couple factors you know uh my son is like officially taller than me now yeah. getting serious you know want to lock in there I remember having a great conversation with Dale Dale Curry he kind of messed me up because at one side he was like play one more year than you can and so I was like what he was like play one more year than you can so like you can play you can like you know you're gonna be good this year play an extra year on top of that 
And uh, but on the other side, he was like, man, I had to go home. Like I had two boys in high school, like giving their mama fits. Like I had to go home and kick him in the butt. So that was a factor at two. Um, and then I think the biggest thing was just the momentum that I'm that I, I have on the business side. Yeah. You know, finally start my own fund. Um, got a few business ventures on the team ownership side. Um, uh, soccer, golf, yeah. uh, some other things that are in the play, and it was a lot of juggling. And uh, it's funny because it was like I felt like basketball was in the way, which sounds insane. And I think that was like confirmation that you know I'm actually executing and doing it right on that side. Yo, so who was the per- first person that you told about this retirement? It's you, yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah. And when when it came down to it, when it in regards to retirement and everything, what was How'd you feel when you you for sure just said it out loud? Well, I think, you know, I'm, you know, I think I've exhausted. I haven't exhausted because that's the hardest part, you know. I'm pretty sure you're going you're gonna to ask me that. You know, what am I going to miss? And, you know, you have your moments. Like, I have my moments where, I, you know, I get into a rhythm. I'm like, oh, I, I know for sure I can still play. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, I've been watching a lot of my old videos a lot lately, which mm-hmm. has been weird. It feels weird, but at the same time, it's like you goosebumps. It's like I'm getting ready for the season again. And so that's happened a few times. But I think it's more just like clarity. Because huh. there's a lot of unknowns, and I think that's the hardest part. Like we're so used to like knowing what our days are gonna look like. Yeah. And I think for me, the hard part is like, what are the days gonna look like? Like I'm slammed and busy as ever, yeah. but at the same time it's like, but I still don't have that same like routine. Like it was constant, like that's who you became. It's like breathing. And so to, for that to leave, it feels like, you know, something's missing. And so it's like, you, you kind of inch toward it all the time. Like I walk through the house and do this sometimes. And it's like, a, is, is that gonna still feel weird? And so, you know, you have all types of thoughts, but in the grand scheme, it's like I'm pretty confident and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm gonna be good going forward. Mm-hmm. Well, last year you said that you're only coming back one more year because Steph asked you to. Was that another part that you thought about, like with Steph, or you like, oh shit, like? Uh, it's funny. Do you think, I know I'm the first person you told, and I'm not too sure if you told him yet, but did he try to speak and get you back? Or? Uh, no, he didn't. But it's funny because somebody on a team who folks would least suspect, he asked me to. He was like, "Yo, you gotta, you gotta run it back." Well, no, a couple guys said it. Like my young boys, like J.K.'s my man. Yeah. Uh, Harrison Barnes still doesn't believe me because I tell Harrison all the time, like, "I'm man, I'm done." And I think you don't want to. I don't want to have certain feelings while I'm playing. And I started having those feelings. Yeah. Those feelings start creeping in the last year or two. Like certain things, I was like, yo, I'm just not feeling this part of it. And before, I love the game so much and I'm young enough to just get over it. Now I'm in a place where it's like, no, nah, I really can't get over that. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like, it's no, it's black and white. There's no gray area. Yeah. And there was a lot of like the other side. I was like, no, nah, I, I, this is really affecting me in my emotions like I can't I can't I just can't do it mm-hmm. and so um I had a few teammates be like no you got to come back but one guy in particular was like serious like no you got to come back and it's funny because I had like t- three teams call me one of them I actually was serious I thought about it I knew I knew I wasn't but I actually was like huh that actually would work and we'd be really good like I actually did think about that mm-hmm. so now that you're going to be walking away from the game what do you think you'll miss the most um the plane rides are pretty smooth. I think the plane rides. You gonna miss the plane rides? The yeah, most? man. Cause when you in the air and it's different than, uh, cause you get to ride private for free, <laughs> and I'm not paying for private flights. <laughs> like I ain't. I I just so, I don't. You know, I don't care how much money I got. I ain't got it. So you're not gonna miss the free gear, the free shoes, the free. No, nah, I'm missing cause the flights are the only time where I feel like I got peace. Yeah. Like you can't really you got Wi Fi up there, but you can't call me. Yeah. Like I can't be disturbed. Like I get really good naps on the plane. Like I'm I'm I lead the earth. Mm-hmm. Literally. And like I like the plane rides. Like mm-hmm. I, and I don't play cards. I can get my reading done. I got a lot of work done mm-hmm. on the airplane because I just like 
everything like I'll, like rookies always try to sit next to me. I'm like, no, nah, move. So I had my two big chairs, and I was just like, I was really. It was like it was like golf. It was like a golf state. It's peaceful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like the planes. All right, then what do you think <laughs> you're gonna miss least about the game? Then people ask you for advice. What am I gonna miss the least? Ooh, I'm trying to be a good Samaritan and try to be a good ambassador to games, but I'm I'm not gonna miss the refs. A few of them, a few of them had me like, yeah. Ref made me so mad last year. I'm like, yeah, I need to retire because I, 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 I don't need to be where I'm at right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being for real. <laughs> so, and then, so that's that's the most the refs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so now that you're moved, because some, you know why, yeah. and it's not like, and I hope they don't try to clip this to where I say they're cheating because I'm not saying that. I'm saying they are too involved in the yeah, game, yeah. and it's not. I'm not saying it's them. I'm saying the objective of officiating is to uh, keep the game within the rules and held accountable, to be as unseen as possible. So I don't need to know your name. I don't need to know your number. I don't need to know your routine. I don't need to know what movies you like. I saw. Uh, uh, JaVale had it on his, uh, JaVale was showing me. They had it on certain arenas. They had the uh, bios of the referees, like what school they went to, their favorite meal, their favorite movie. Like, I'm like, what? I'm like, I've never seen this. They were like, yeah, be in arenas. Like, get to know the refs. No, nah, man, like, no, nah, like, move around. Like, let us be us. Like, that's what people come to see. And so, like, I want the game to be pure. So I'm a purist of the game. So that's all I'm saying. What's retirement gonna look like most for you? Like, give us like, what's your next five years gonna be like? That you're screaming at your, you know, so ready to rush out. There's other business opportunities and stuff. Where can we see you next? Are we gonna see you courtside, RIP Mamba, like Mamba? Or are we going to be like, uh, you I'm, know what I mean? Are you gonna be in the background? Like, how, how long will it take for you to pop back in and let people see you, Guadalla? That's interesting, good question. Cause I told uh, Loon that I'll never touch a basketball again and. I probably won't come to a game for like a couple years. But uh, I do have a couple games on my calendar that I'll be at this year. We'll be at the game 2-8, um, February 8th in LA. And then uh, there's a couple special dates on my calendar that I got marked that I'll, I'll be at a couple games. Like I'm, I'm gonna go see, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, like go travel to see like maybe like a couple, like three or four games, that's it, but I'll be there. Um, but with some of the business that I have, I have to be at some sporting events. So like I'll be at a bunch of football games, which is interesting. I'll be at a bunch of football games. Um, finally get the chance to go to Augusta in April. I'm looking forward to that. I'll be at Augusta, Georgia in April. Uh, that's gonna be fun. You're saying going to games and everything, and one thing I've learned or enjoyed since retiring was becoming a fan, mm -hmm. like a real wholehearted fan. I know even on this pod, you kept your competitive nature up. You gave out flowers a lot, but who's some some players right now that you can't wait to go, you know, fanboy over? Yeah. Whether it be in this sport, basketball, or any yeah. sport, you gonna follow Rory yeah. all around Europe? Yeah. Like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Cause, like, uh, I actually got a chance to tell him, like LeBron, it was really hard to really uh like give him flowers like you don't want to like show too much respect because you got to compete against him and so you know he's a little bit older now but he's still dominating the game uh it's funny i watched Steph on tv in miami and uh i was kind of like i was jumping a few i was like oh i was doing that watching him uh that it was they were playing dallas that was a crazy game uh so looking forward to obviously seeing him uh anthony edwards um big fan of his um I'm really looking forward to uh, watching his development. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Brandon Ingram. Yeah. And I seen him in the playoffs and he stepped up. And you obviously know like your first playoff series is different. Like most guys struggle and he's like rose to the occasion. So looking forward to seeing him continue to develop. Uh, I'm looking forward to JT Tatum. I wanna see uh, how he adjust to being dominant late in games because the game can be so easy for him and we've had conversations so I'm really looking forward to seeing him and then like you know Katie's in year 17 still doing what he can do uh book is book keeps getting better which yeah. is crazy like yeah. book keeps getting yeah. better uh book keeps getting better 
Um, like my peers that are still doing it, CP. Like yeah. it's good to see, like CP is still CP out there. Like yeah. it's amazing what That's he's amazing. doing. But yeah, I'm, I, I'm, and then like using the pod to be a fan of the game too. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. And yeah, well, you brought up CP, and uh, clearly he just, you know, got traded to the Warriors and everything. Have you all spoken about like what it's like? Have you been like, yo, here goes your spot? Make sure you look out for my young guys for me. You're the new adult in the locker room, or are you just legit just gonna show up and be like, yo, do your thing and lead them? Point God. Yeah, we've been talking a little bit. Um, when it first happened, we spoke a couple times, and then uh, he's been doing a great job of uh, looking after JK. Yeah. And so I text him uh, about that, like, you know, really appreciative of that. Um, I think he's going to be a really good addition to the team. I think he's got a lot left in the tank. And so uh, I'm, I'm really interested to see the type of year that they can have. Like, you know, you know how that team is. Like it can go, they can win a championship, or you know yeah. they can, you know, you know we never know. Like we were that close to being a playing team, yeah. you know. So it's gonna be interesting there, but uh, definitely rooting for them, uh, obviously, because a bunch of my guys are over there. Well, now we got that out the way. We want to go down memory lane. Since mm-hmm. you have that announcement, you played in the NBA for almost two decades, and a lot of uh, it's a lot of firsts that occurred, but a lot of dope shit that occurred as well. So mm-hmm. we're gonna go. Uh, you know, more, more so culture into a couple of uh, key points. Let's talk about, uh, you know, your draft night memory. What do you remember most from getting drafted back uh, at the ninth pick? Besides the Dick Vitale thing. You know what's funny about draft night? I was not happy. Why not? I, I don't think I've ever told that. So I was projected. I had really good workouts. So I was projected to go three to the Bulls um, or it might have been six or seven, something like that. Six, it might have been six to Atlanta. And so Ben Ben Gordon had a crazy workout where he didn't miss a shot in the whole workout. So he went third. Uh, it was funny because I think it was Washington had like the fifth pick or something like that. I think Washington had the fifth pick and they traded it because they were, they said, if you would be here, we would keep it, but you ain't going to be here. So we trading it. And so then Josh Childress went sixth. I'm like, huh? And then Luau went to Phoenix at seven, which got traded to Chicago. So, but the, luckily I did. A, um, I had a safety net workout with Philly before I went to New York to the draft, and it was like you know, you t- about one of your drafts. You was like, bro, I took like four shots. Yeah, yeah, that's how you. It think, was yeah. one of them type of workouts where I I had a real workout, but I used it because I wanted to work out. Like, yo, yeah. I, I want to work out anyway. Let me just yeah. get a workout in. And they was like, all right, this could be your workout. You just working out. And so that's my safety. And then uh, Toronto came at eight, and the cameras came around. I'm like, man, I didn't work out for Toronto. But they picked the other dude, right? <laughs> but like, I felt like I felt like like I slipped in the draft. I'm like, I was low key. I was kind of tight. Like I was hot about yeah. that. Um, but I never forget uh, one of my memorable moments was uh, Josh Childress being like, "Yo, we in the NBA now." But it still was bothering me, so I didn't really respond. I'm just like, "Yeah." But then later that night, I'm like, "Yo, we really in the league right now." So like, he kind of got me out of it. Uh, but the draft night, draft night was, it was. Draft night was cool. Mm. It was cool. I'm not a big like celebrator, so we went out, but like I didn't know how to go to the club and kick it anyway, so it was just it was a regular night. What spot did you go to? Forty forty? Nah, I don't know where we went. Ben Gordon had a party somewhere. It was dope. But Ben Ben Gordon's from New York. Ben Gordon, mm. I, he, he had was his Range number Rover. Three, right? He was drafting number three. He had his Range Rover already. He had, he had a blue Range. It was cold, and I wanted one, but I ain't had no money, so yeah. I ain't I, I didn't buy nothing before the draft, yeah. and so. Uh, I remember you saying you thought you were going to Chicago until Ben went to went to Chicago and didn't miss for that whole workout, right? Didn't miss a whole workout. Yeah, he didn't miss a shot. Like, it was sent wires through, like, everybody. I was in Charlotte working out for the uh, Bobcats at the mm. time, and this is before they traded up to the two pick. <laughs> and so I'm in the middle of the workout. Oh, we got done with the workout. Yeah. We, like, having lunch, and it's, like, six of us. It was like, yo, everybody phone buzzing. And this is before social media, so, mm. like, like it, it hit everybody phone like text like yo Ben Gordon didn't miss a shot yeah. for a whole workout and it was like man and I remember telling Ben like yo my, my funny thing my agent knew like the draft order yeah he was like yo Ben Gordon going three and I told him he was like really and um we knew Sean was going four we knew Devin was going five and so like uh six seven eight nine was like a toss-up yeah yeah so you said you didn't spend much before the draft or whatever but like talk about your suit what'd you wear what do you remember? Uh, so LAV, I wonder if they st- LAV still should be around. It's probably called something something else. But LAV had the league on lock, like they were making the Walkers. 
Uh, they made your suits. Oh, wait, shit, they made mine too. That's a lot for a nineteen, like a twenty-one year old kid. Right, but it was from from my experience, it was very respectable. Yeah, like, for sure. and from what I heard, like I didn't hear too many crazy stories like such and such going on. So like, it was a very respectable yeah, company. Yeah. Um, and so, uh. Killer Cam, I was a fan of around a time. So in college, I would wear pink from time to time. <laughs> I would have like I would have like pink on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, cause Cam, that's yeah. when he, you know, yeah, he had man. the pink yeah. Range Rover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I wanted a blue suit with pink pinstripes, but it didn't come out right. So they just made me a blue pinstripe suit, like a power broker suit. And then I had like a pink uh, striped shirt with a uh, like a blue, sh- blue bluish pink lined up tie it was a nice look though it was cool i still got the suit to this day like i kept it it was long in the mug it was like five buttons yeah you could probably still wear it can't you it'd be too long if i wore it yeah. it, was, it was crazy long but that was it back then but, but it wasn't crazy baggy though because everybody's suits were baggy yeah, back then of MJ. it was baggy <laughs> but it wasn't their baggy yeah. and so it's uh it's somewhere in the house well looking back on the draft you're a draft with a lot of great players as you just mentioned who's somebody that you would love to give a salute to from your draft class where you saw their career and you're like yo this was we started at the same time you mentioned josh children's like holy shit we're in the nba mm-hmm. but like that longevity that journey who as to be a future hall of famer who's somebody where you're like yo you you did your thing too uh dwight doesn't get enough credit yeah. like dwight like he had the league in a strong hold for a while like dwight was incredible man it's kind of it's upsetting how guys put a lot of work and do a lot of things for the league and the perception that comes yeah. from however they try to put him in a certain lane. But if I'm picking a guy, I'm picking Luau Dang. And uh, I was able to reach out to him recently and be like, yo, bro, we got to connect. Like, I got, whenever you're in Africa, I want to be there yeah. with you because we were always competing against each other. And it's like we never really spoke. Like, even in the games, we didn't talk trash. Like, he had some really good games against me, and I had some really good games against him. And I knew he was playing a little extra hard versus me. And I think he knew that I was playing a little yeah. extra harder versus him. So I think it was a respect thing. Like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the second best player in the draft. You know, obviously Dwight. And so we had some really good battles. Um, but he handled his business as a professional better than anybody. You know, uh, he was a true uh, steward of the game. Um, he held the league down wherever he went. He had a great reputation. Um, the Lakers tried to do him crazy at the yeah, end. That was crazy. But he got his money though. He got seventy million. He got yeah, his money yeah, though. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, all seventy one. Big respect for Luau yeah. Dang, man. Big yeah. respect. But after that draft night, you always talk about when people are like things change tremendously as soon as the draft is over. Um, what's one of the first things you remember when you first walked into the league? How things changed from like a personal standpoint to a relationship standpoint to just comprehending I'm no longer in Kansas, a.k.a. Arizona anymore? Um, relationships change. People people try to place themselves in a certain position in your life and, like, have a stronghold. Yeah. And uh, it's, like, really ter- – it's very territorial. And you see it all around the league. Yeah. You, like, you see it with your friends, family. Like, you see it all it's the time. It's a vicious cycle. Like yeah. Entourage. Yeah, just yeah. anybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, you see that. You know, who met who first, yeah. who been around the longest. You hear that a lot. Um, but one thing uh, I think I had in my favor was after I got drafted, I went home. We had a barbecue. It was cool. It was like, you know, I finally got my car. I was, you know, I was feeling myself. But it wouldn't be like four days went by and Tim Grover called me like, where you at? Get your ass back up here in the gym. And so I went right back to Chicago and just got right back to work. And so uh, I think I just, you know, I was very blessed and very fortunate to be, I was always around people who had my best interests. Like they may not have been the closest to me or around me the most, Yeah. but for some reason, I always had an open ear to those folks. Uh-huh. Like, I made sure, like, if certain people said things, it was like, okay, if whatever he's saying, like, I'm gravitating towards uh-huh. that. You mentioned Tim Grover. What did you learn from him that you, you know, or how did you get connected with him in order to get prepared for the draft? And what's the relationship with MJ, like, a huge thing as well, where you're like, I'm going to the NBA, I need to get Mike Trainer. Yeah, so that was when I interviewed agents to go to the draft. I had already heard his name. Uh, Will Bynum went to Arizona. 
Yeah. I was with him for a semester at Arizona my freshman year before he transferred to Georgia Tech. And so Will would – Will Bynum would always talk about Tim Grover. And he was like, man, I worked out with Tim Grover one time and then played in the pro-am after that and had 40. <laughs> And so it was like yeah, this, one of them young kids. Yeah, it was like them of, yeah. fables or tales. Yeah, it was true though. Like, yeah. and it was like, yo, I was like, I'm working out with Tim Grover. Like, it's just what you do to go to the league. Yeah, you know that's that was what it was. And so when I interview agents, the first thing I said was, you know, I want to get to work. I want to work out with Tim Grover. And you, you know, who paying for it? Because I heard it was expensive. Uh-huh. And so all the agents agreed. And then one agent had me working out. No, two agents had me work out with Grover when I interviewed them. So I had two agents in Chicago huh. that I interviewed, R.I.P. Uh, Hank Thomas. Wow. And so uh, I said, well, part of the interview is I want you to give me work out with Tim Grover. And uh, I spoke about this before, but my first workout with Tim Grover, um, like it wasn't even done with the first drill. Like four minutes in, I thought about going back to college. I was like. Oh no no this I ain't, I ain't got it I ain't got it it was that hard yeah. but but then after you get through it it was like that was more so like the moment where like the perception changed for me like everything changed because once I got done with that workout I was like okay if I go to the league this is gonna be like every day yeah. so like ain't no more playing around ain't no more like there ain't no more fun like just kicking it like hanging out like oh no we in the gym like all mm-hmm. day like we getting ready. And so that's when it kind of like clicked for me. Mm-hmm. So talk about some of your first, when you first arrived, uh, you know, in practice, and you first see Allen Iverson, mm-hmm. and then you fast forward to your first game of your NBA career. Yeah, so yeah, I went into practice with like no expectations really. I think uh, my agent did a good job, Rob Polinka did a good job of saying like, okay, I think you got opportunity to get some minutes, but you know, you're a rookie, you know, you may not play as much as you want, but every day just try to get better and just play hard. And my first impression of practice was like a defensive drill. And that's when I had the respect for Coach Olsen. Mm -hmm. Because everything was just clicking. Like shell drill, ball handling things, like certain things, three-man weaves, passes on point. Like everything was, everything, it was just, it was like normal to me. But I'm seeing like eight, seven, eight-year vets, they can't figure out shell drill or they messing up rotations. I'm just looking like, what are y'all doing? Like, how their, you? their weight routine is they left like 15 year olds. You're like, bro, y'all like who been training? Like who been training y'all this this whole time? Right. Yeah. Or they just this is their first time hooping all summer or yeah. all year. Yeah, yeah. From, from last year. Yeah. And so when I saw that, I was like, huh. And then I had some success like first couple practices, and Allen Iverson was just like a larger than life figure. And so you just basically like he talk about Michael Jordan having that aura like that glow like he had the glow when I saw him like he had the aura as like oh that's Allen Iverson but he was super funny and so he just brought a calmness to it like I'm like man this dude is hilarious and I remember uh three man weed they threw me alive and I windmilled it and he was like oh this little motherfucker crazy but uh, let's see how long you gonna be doing that and I'm like what you mean I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life he was like nah bro like year four you gonna stop doing that? Yeah, you start hearing like oh, it's like why aren't you icing? You're like I don't need no ice. It's like no, you need ice, bro. Like, sure yeah. enough, sure enough. Like year three, four come around. No, no, no. We laying everything up unless we in the game. Like yeah, like so. But then going to the first game, I never forget the first game we playing Boston, and uh, it was against Paul Pierce, who was like I had been watching Paul a lot, and uh, he was talking. He he always talked trash. He always, and then Antoine Walker, who I spent some time with in the summer because he was in Chicago. Yeah, Chicago. So he, he was, was a the, man in Chicago. People don't forget. The man, you, you hang out with Jordan or Jordan let you around him. Like you were that dude. He had like yeah. the D. He wasn't yeah. like D Rose in but terms he's up of like there, bro. He had everybody. He, he had, was like he was D Rose man. in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. And he you had know, every well within our walking. community, the yeah. black community, he was like a D Rose yeah. figure. Yeah. And yeah. so going up against him, uh, and it, I think you just want to prove to people like what you can do, especially, you know. East Coast bias in college basketball coming from Arizona, so folks don't really know. Um, but I remember making my first shot. I made some big plays defensively. Um, I scored a few couple buckets. Like, I had a really good game. And I remember, like, I, I, t- I spoke about this before. Nike rep came up to me after the game was like, hey, man, you really good. <laughs> <laughs> so this, you made a three? He was like, like man, I mean, you hit your first three, man. Oh, man, you can hoop. You're going to be around for a long time. So it was, uh, it was good to go through that in my first game. But, like, it was no jitters. None of that. I just felt like I was just prepared. You just mentioned Iverson star power and everything. What was something crazy that you saw from the time kicking on Iverson where you're like, yo, that's that's a star and 
you know, a franchise player, like, was there anything that you took from where you're like, this is, this is going to be me? Uh, well, one thing he had happen to him a lot, I knew it never would happen to me. Like, people would just be waiting around at the hotel for him, like, just for him. And, like, obviously I played with the Warriors, and we had – we no one could wait in the hotel because we had to clear it out because it got crazy. Yeah. But, like, people would be, like, lined up in the hotel, like, like he had like a he was like that dude yeah. and i think how humble he was around us was really cool it was like he never like big timed yeah. anybody like he was more of a kid and you know just like yeah. the rest of us and so i think it put a lot of things in perspectives now we all we all have our days but um he was very consistent with me i always say he always he was the one that was always telling me hey man don't ever say nobody else good like I remember saying, like Rip Hamilton mm. is like really good. Like I was a big Rip, Rip Hamilton fan. He was like, man, you better than him. And so like he just like the confidence part he gave me, and I I took that like every time I stepped on the court. Like I talk about it when in Finals MVP. Like in that whole series, I'm walking on the court like, man, I'm about to get 30 tonight. I I really can do what I want on the court. Like I can control the game. And I I just kind of took that confidence from being around him so much. So, t- will you tell a story real quick about uh, when Allen Iverson introduced you to uh, Jay Z? <laughs> when it's co- coming down to confidence and everything like that. Yeah. So he had a he took me out to dinner one time, and I can tell it felt like he didn't do this often. Like I appreciated the gesture. He was like we was in we were in, we were in New York, yeah, yeah. and New York has become my my favorite city, and. Um, so this is like my first time in New York as a like an adult with some money. Like mm. I can pretty much do what I want, but I don't know New York like I know New York. And so he's like, "Yo, uh, we going out tonight?" I'm like, "You taking me out with you tonight? Like who else going? Like it's gonna be a bunch <laughs> of." Us. He's like, "No, nah, just me and you." I'm That's like, the worst and when you got to go hang out with the vet. And it's, like, it's just y- y'all used to do that to me all the time. I'm like, bro, I mean, know y'all to be hanging out one on one. See, this could be off. And like, I never even thought about it. Yeah, like and I used that. to be like, bro, I don't mean like you not gonna like me. Like <laughs> You not going to wipe me at all. I can tell you that. <laughs> no, but he, like, he took me out, like, one-on-one, me and him. And I'm used to being around him with, like, a group of people. Oh, that's crazy, one and, and he's more so, like, he's, like, a character, but he's himself. Like, he's not acting. But, like, the dude could draw. He could, like, rap. He could, yeah. like, country music sing. Like, it was insane, like, the talents he had. But it was always, like, he was putting on the show. But for him, one-on-one, he was a little bit more shy, reserved. Yeah. And so it was interesting to like interact with him like that. And uh, we went to P. Diddy's restaurant. Justin's, right? Yes, P. Diddy had a restaurant. And so we went there. But before we went there, I needed a coat. So he was like, let's go to Sean John. And we (laughs) went shopping. Sean John was was it at the time. Yes, so he took me to Sean John and uh, it was his white puff coat, puffer coat. It was cold. It had like the fur on the hood. He was a man. And (laughs) But it was, it was like right here on my sleeves, and he was like, "Man, that coat too little, man. Raise your arms." And he, he like cracking, he like he just love cracking jokes on you, no matter what. And so I raised my arm. He's like, "That coat too little, but you gonna get it anyway." And but he was like, "No, nah, it fit. It's cool. Get it." So he made me believe it fit. So I got it. He paid. He bought me some clothes, whatever. He looked out. So we had dinner, and then after that, we had a driver. So he was like, yo, let's go to the uh, 4040, see what's going on over there. So we pulled to the 4040, and he was like, it looked dead in there. But it was a Maybach outside, baby blue Maybach, two-tone, navy blue and baby blue. That's, and, the, one. Uh, that's, the, that's the whip that Cameron wanted to move for in, in front of Def Jam. There you go. Yeah. So uh, we, we, we pulled up, and we didn't get out, but we stopped. He rolled down the window. I think security saw him. And then we sat there for like, it wasn't that long, like three or four minutes. And he was like, man, I don't know, man. I don't want to go in there if it's dead. Like, I don't, like, I ain't going in there if it's dead just to come back out. <laughs> so we start the car about to pull off, and the dude was like, yo, somebody come out. Somebody comes out the door like, yo, Jay in there. You want to say what's up? And then he looked at me. He was like, you want to go say what's up to Jay? And I'm, I'm like, cheesing. He was like, this little motherfucker, <laughs> but young head. He's called me young head, right? So I'm, like, <laughs> I'm cheesing just like right, that. Right. So we get out the car. We go up. And so they chilling in there. Jay with Tata might have been like one other dude, right? And they just chilling in the back. And uh, he, everybody say what's up. And he was like, "Yo, this is my young fella, right here. He a bad, he a bad motherfucker. You gonna see him? He he a bad boy. He bad, he a bad one. He cold." And he was like, "What's up?" And I was like, "Yo, how you doing, Andre Godala?" 
And he looked at me, and he just went back, and he was like this, right? <laughs> so I ain't think nothing of it. <laughs> so I never forget the next day, we get on the bus for shoot around. As soon as I get on the bus, hey, this stupid young punk, we meet Jay-Z, and he tell him his whole name. I'm Andre Iguodala. <laughs> He know who you is, fool. He watch TV and he just go off on me about, like, bro, don't you ever say your whole name to somebody. Like, you here now. People know who you are. And man, he would not stop messing with me. And then I wore that coat to the game the night before. He cracked on me the whole night about my coat being too small. I'm like, bro, you told me that it would fit. Like, you, I should get it. I ain't say that. And so, like, I learned a lesson. Like, he would set you up to kill you. But it was like, it was all in love though. So it was, it was super funny. But like. I was self-conscious about wearing this coat, but the coat fit to me, so I just wore it when I wasn't around him. You ever notice, like, you kind of, you, you're not, like, always, like, your vet or whatever, but you ever notice you always turn into your vet because exactly what you, how he, criti- like, bothered you is exactly how you bothered me. Yes. Like, like, you know, <laughs> so, like, the, like, I'm, like, sitting here, like, hara- this sounds right. No wonder, bro. You, you'll buy me a suit yeah. and be like, you look like a goddamn idiot. <laughs> stand the right way, bro. How's somebody going to buy? I'm supposed to spend all this money on a suit? And you standing like that? Where's your confidence, man? You stand by right. socks. What are you doing? Like, you go absolutely crazy. And it's like, it makes sense now. Trauma. So we fast forward to after your rookie year to, mm-hmm. you know, after, what was it, like your third year, fourth year? You led the league in uh, minutes, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then you're up for a big time contract. Talk about your first time resigning. Yeah, yeah, that was. And interesting. what you remember from that as well? So I remember from signing is that I didn't, I didn't sign my, uh, I didn't sign my extension. So my extension, they offered me sixty. I turned it down. And one thing I don't know, but this is something that AI taught me. He was like, "Man, my rookie year, my rookie year was fun. Like my rookie, my rookie year was the probably my favorite year because I just had fun. Like you just traveling, playing basketball, no pressure. Like." AI taking all the pressure and he taking it all off me. Like, it was just easy. Like, we just had fun. And then Chris Webber, who was like my idol, that's why I started playing basketball, watching MJ and Fab Five. So, like, I'm just in kitty land. You know what I mean? And so, as you grow older, AI is like, listen, man, they're going to change. Like, don't read the paper. Because I used to read the paper because mm-hmm. that was just my routine. Don't read the paper. They're going to turn on you. You got to be ready. Like, they're going to turn on you at some point. I'm just like, huh? Like, it can't be that bad. I turned on that contract and I went to a comedy show. And I see Spank. Spank is like improv and like he just on the stage talking crazy. And Spank was like, who the Iguodala? That man turned down $60 million <laughs> and just goes on like a 10 minute rant. And that, that became like normal just like, I'm like, man, I can't even go outside. Everywhere I went, like it was just brought up, like just going to get a cheesesteak. Yeah. Man, you turned out all that money, is you crazy? Like just, I'm like, Did oh, you ever second guess it? Is- like after you turned it down? Like, no, no I, never? That was the crazy thing. I mean, thing. it turned out 60 million, like 06, 07, then, bro, like, is aggressive. Because like that was like, now. yeah, like a bajillion. Yeah. yeah, it's like 150 now. <laughs> but it's funny because that was the one of the, like, strong suits, the power of Rob Palenka. Like, he really had me believing, like, bro, they are lowballing you. Like, there's no way you could take. So I see kids now, and I'm like, what is your agent telling you? What? Are you crazy? But I'm believing my agent the same way. But... I do think Rob had a sense of who he was dealing with. Yeah. Like he know the yeah. work I was putting in, in every summer. Like yeah. I'm doing I'm doing two days in the summer. I'm watching film. He know I'm I ask a million questions about Kobe every day. Mm-hmm. He know what I'm doing. So he's like, bro, like, no, bro. And he's like, I got you a deal over here for this anyway. So we cool. So I had a backup plan anyway. So I'm knowing that yeah, things yeah. the team don't know yeah. too. And so uh but the hardest part about that is when you go into that season and you got eighty two games. You know how many games that is. But when you're only in year, this was going into year three. Yeah. No, this is going into year four. I didn't take this attention. Going into year four, 82 games don't feel like 82 games. So, like, every single game after the game, I'm looking at the stat sheet like, damn, I ain't going to get it. Next game, damn, yeah, I'm going to get it. Next game, damn, I ain't going to get it. Next game, oh, I'm going to get it. Like, it was just like that roller coaster, like, for what? Yeah. You know, like, it's just such a big body of work. It's going to av- – law of average is going to be where it's supposed to be anyway. Yeah. And so – um. We had a solid year. Went to the playoffs. We weren't supposed to go to the playoffs. That's, and price is statistically your best year in the league, right? It was. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. It was. It was. And uh, the funny thing is, though, we played this play Boston in the playoffs. No, not Boston. Played Detroit. Did Detroit. Yeah. Played Detroit, yeah. Detroit. Yeah. Like, you can't score on them, Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I averaged, like, three less points than my average. And 
And you can't do that in Philly. So they was just like, man, he ain't even worth this. He ain't worth that. You had to go through that. Funny thing is, then they paid Elton after he tore his Achilles, but then they had me on ice. And it was just like that. That's when that relationship started to be feel weird. Like, what are we doing here? And uh, we ended up getting a deal done. And uh, yeah, that was the first deal. That's so, probably the first time I geeked out on a deal. Yeah. What did you do afterwards? What was your first big, big splurge? I bought. I was supposed to buy one watch. Dude was giving me. <laughs> dude was giving me a crazy disc, discount on an AP. Crazy discount. And so, uh, was it the same dude that made your, your AI nine? Your AI nine? No, 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 no. This right is this is, a, this is this is our watch guy. Okay, uh, Alex. Shown, oh, Alex, Alex. In, in okay, Chicago, Geneva yeah. Sales. Shout out Geneva Sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, have you been dealing with Alex that long? For a while, yeah. That was yeah. 2008. Did he give you a free watch yet? Damn, that's a good question. That should be. I'm gonna send him. Oh this yeah, you pop. should hit him, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cause that's kind of crazy. So I end up buying two watches because the discount was so big. I'm like. <laughs> All right, we'll just add another one to it. It's the same thing after the discount, right? <laughs> so technically, it was a free watch, right? Yeah, it yeah. wasn't free because it was a little bit more than the yeah. discount. But uh, I remember my financial advisor was like, "Bro, why you end up getting two watches?" I was like, "Man, he gave me a discount, so it was like I just got another watch." Like, end up being free, whatever. I try to finesse it, and then uh, yeah, I went through like a splurge for like a year. I was glad I got it out of my system quick though. I went through that splurge and then I was. When I it. met you, you had like a Louis fetish. Right? Yep, you yep, had a yep. Bentley. Yep. <laughs> Bentley flying spur. I had a flying spur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, only, a, that only lasted for like a year yeah, though. Yeah, you had a Burberry umbrella. I did. Uh, you yeah, you got a great bro, memory. I remember this thing. So when you used to speak to me, this thing got ner- got the nerves. <laughs> <laughs> like when I showed up, bro, I thought your name was Andre Vuitton. G. At one point, I'm like. Damn. Yeah, I actually live down the street from King of Pressure, so yeah, no, you, you, just, you ride a bike to the mall. All right, so we'll go back. Um, you know, we go to 2012 where you made your first uh, NBA All Star mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and All Defensive Team, right? Correct. And yeah. that was you had been in the league for what seven or eight years? Seven, eight, eight years. Yeah. Go back to that season. Yeah. I know you always harped on. Uh, you and I had conversations about all defense and what it means to you and you hang your hat on. So go back to remembering being on that list, second team, and who you saw up there. Yeah, I was – you know, what? that's when I, like, I started to sour a little bit because I had been, you know, I had been in an organization where I didn't know – you don't know what the NBA is until you go mm-hmm. to another team. Yeah. And so you really don't know. And so uh, you go through your ups or downs, especially in Philly. Uh, you had your highs, you had some lows, and uh, we were finally winning, putting it together a little bit. And um, but I had been like, I felt like I was one of the best defenders in the, in on the perimeter for like six, seven years. Like Shane Battier was like one of the guys that would guard Kobe. Ron Ron was different. I give him that. Ron Ron was different. Uh, Rajah Bell was one of the guys, and Bruce Bowen. But for me, I was like, man, I'm scoring on these dudes. Like, I was a go-to scorer, yeah. so I'm like, I'm scoring on y'all. Like, no, nah, like, it, I, I know my defense is what it is, but I, I couldn't figure out, like, what what am I missing? And so what I learned was it was, you know, winning has plays a part in it. And so it was finally good. It wasn't even like I really cared too much about it because I always – I forget that I even made second team all defense that year. No, I remember – I was, when we were playing, I remember you were like, I don't care anymore because you brought up all these names. And it's like this person averages two two steals and he's a terrible defender and vice versa. And then you finally made it when you stopped caring. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it, it was just at that point I was just like, listen, you, you, like the 2010 World Championship. Yeah. I led the team in minutes played. This was D. Rose and KD. You know, this was them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just KD's coming out party. Yeah. And I was just locking up everybody. And I'm like, y'all see what I'm doing? Like, Linus Klazer? Klazer. Klazer could go. Klazer from Lithuania? So he's I, a problem. I've been knowing about Lithuania. Yeah, yeah bro, he's a problem. And I, hoop I, out there. I've been knowing about Lithuania. Lithuania might be the basketball capital of the world. That's all they do out there. Like, I get it. Yeah. And uh, they said, Pops? Is Pop? Popovich Lithuania? It sounds Lithuanian. Right. Now, now Akovic is, is Yugoslavian, ain't it? I mean, they broke up and just split some lines, but like, the same similar knowledge of the game. And so when I'm playing against Lithuania or then uh, we had Turkaloo, Turkey in the championship game. Turkaloo was a problem. Yeah, Barbosa did drop me, but like nobody could score on me at that time, like for like a four or five year stretch. I mean, 
the guys are gonna do their thing, like LeBron's, Kobe's, Melo's, mm -hmm. but you know, Cole and Kobe to four for 17, and then Phil, about Phil that Jackson one. saying, I've never seen anybody guard Kobe Bryant like that. Like this was in the headlines of the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'm just like, whoa. Like Aaron McKee hit me up after the game, was like, man, do you realize what Phil Jackson just said? Phil Jackson really said this. Man, now, now, that's, <laughs> now, now finish off that story. Oh, everybody know that story. <laughs> But no, uh, absolutely. Four, three weeks, three and a half <laughs> weeks later, the man said, yo, where's Dre? Tell him 50 tonight. Tell Dre 50 tonight. And it was a 49 piece. <laughs> I blame Chris Webber, though. See, Webber, you my guy. But if you go – I went back and watched that game. No, he did make some crazy shots, like from three. He was shooting threes like Steph. He made some Steph threes, and but they was pick and rolling. Like the triangle was just unfair. Like you can – you couldn't do nothing with the triangle. You can't guard nobody in the triangle. The brush screens off. Uh, that Chicago cut is tough. Oh the God. brush screen oh off the triangle is and it's, it's right in front of the rim and yeah. you get a good screener, yeah. it's over. And People don't understand, nothing. like, yeah. a good screener can make your whole career. True story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stockton. Yeah. Well, Stockton was nice. But, but yeah, but then, you know, so I finally stopped caring, made it, whatever. Uh, but the All-Star team thing did mean something, like, finally. Like, I felt like I should have made it two times before that legit yeah do you when you first made it in 2012 you averaged like 12 6 right. and 5 and that's right. not the sexiest numbers on earth but we were number one in the east at the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then like we said the year you played the most minutes in the league you guarded some of the top players you're averaging like 19 6 and 5 that's a learning moment for you know young guys watching this like what do you think what's the difference that really got you over the hurdle and you know what does it tell about like the cycle of the NBA and what it matters you know well Winning always, winning should trump most things. But it's funny because last year we had a situation where Denver was the number one seed. They only had one guy make the All Star team. They probably should have had two. You know, uh, Aaron Gordon probably should have. You know, he probably should have been in there. Murray didn't play enough, but he's probably their other guy. Mm -hmm. But like they were the number one seed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I did learn like you gotta win. Like you know, but I always played to win, which would upset me. Like I played in the, uh, 2010 and then 2012 Olympics. Like I played a role that was uh, centered around winning, like defend, run the floor, different things like that. And so, uh, and I also did learn a lot about your support system within the organization. Like yeah. we hear players talk about that a lot. Yeah. Like players say, we've heard players say like a, a guy is in the bust more so than the organization might be the bust. Uh. You know, you pick the go wrong guy for the wrong system or, you you know, you're not giving him the tools or equipping him in the right manner for him to play to his best ability. Like, we see that all the time. We know we know too many guys uh. that could be in the league just in the wrong situation. Uh. And so um, I started to see that a lot. But then that's when I started to – I already had those conversations in terms of, like, where could I see myself uh, playing at – my highest potential or being in a situation where I could be who I should be on a, on a consistent basis. Another all-star memory I think you should dive deep into, pause, is uh, your dunk contest robbery. Ah. Can you go into that? Because you had some of the best dunks that people, it's like the forgotten dunks. You know, it's actually funny, a thing on YouTube. Funniest thing about uh, the dunk contest, my wife and I, we didn't speak for, we weren't speaking around that time. That's a real relationship. That was funny. Yeah. Uh, what year was that? Oh six. Oh, so she was like in college still, so that was my second year in the league, and so we weren't we weren't speaking. And I remember uh, I got the MVP at the uh, rookie sophomore game the night before, and uh, and then the next day, so we we didn't speak even after that. But then after the dunk contest, the whole robbery thing happened, and I remember seeing uh, Ray Allen in the locker room afterwards, and like we were getting dressed, showering, and getting out of there, and it was just me and him. He was a three point contest. And he gave me some really good advice. He was like, you know, just do the media, be professional, blah, blah, blah. We all know what happened. And this was this was Jesus Shuttlesworth. It seemed like Ray tell everybody that. This ain't even Ray Allen, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know Ray. Like, yeah, I know yeah, Ray true, now. True, true. But I don't know Ray Allen. I know him as Jesus Shuttlesworth. Like, I watch, he got game before every high school game, before every college game, and then, you know, two times a week before NBA, in the NBA, because there's too many games to watch a movie 82 times a year. But like, I done seen this movie 600 times. So he Jesus Shuttlesworth. So I'm listening to him like, and I'm like, okay. like, And then I took his advice. But then it's funny because uh, 
I really wasn't tri- tripping. Like, I was numb to it. I was like, yo, that was just kind of crazy what happened. AI was pissed. <laughs> but I, he was pissed. He was high. He was like, oh, man, we got robbed. We got robbed. <laughs> So did you never do it again to just be like, I don't want to do it again? Or was it like a DeMar DeRozan? I knew I was never doing it again. But DeMar got uh, robbed a bunch of times. He time. did. But I knew I wasn't doing it again. So I was like, man, I ain't tripping. I'm never doing this again. But it was funny. I got back to the hotel. And I'm. it's All-Star Weekend. I already got the rookie game MVP. Like, I, I kind of cared about that more. Yeah. Uh, I was happy about that. And so my wife uh, texts me like, I'm so sorry what they did to you. And it kind of put everything in perspective because I'm like, oh, damn, we not even talking and Shorty came through. Like, yeah, that's real, some bro. sympathy. It was, it was smooth. It was smooth. Yes. So while we're on a dunk contest, a lot of people are going to forget your old head now, but give us some of your top five favorite posters oh, from top. your career that like that you've done because they've been crazy, but you probably <laughs> – um, I told you I've been watching my highlights lately. Um, oh, good for you. Um because one came to mind, I forgot all about that one. So the one on Yao, just because it was Yao, like he was just in the way. Like, he, Man, that dude was seven five. You he, jumped he over is him. Tall. Cause, cause coming off picks, and Yao being there, like he ain't even got a show. He just got to stand there. And you come up with pick, you see Yao. You don't even see like Yao. You just see like torso and like tree trunk legs. You like, God dang, it's like a big red. See a red like this. Like you can't see nothing. You just get off the ball, and they were sending me left. I'll never forget that. They kept sending me left just before I could go left. And I'm like, man, I don't know what to do, man. It's this big-ass object in front of me. Like, Tim Grover had us working out with them big-ass human mm-hmm. objects. But this, like, they ain't had nothing to replicate Yao. And so dunking on him was like, oh, yeah, that's Yao, big-ass. Um, my first one, Rasheed Wallace. i never forget that because Aaron McKee reminded me after the game, not even after the game, like, next time out, he was like, Yo, I don't think you realize, like, you just banged on she. Like, that don't happen. I was like, huh? And Rasheed Wallace was one of my favorite players because I grew up watching Carolina. Um, so, Yao, she, uh, Terrence Williams one was good. Um, that, was, that was dumb. That one was good. Yeah. I just listened to a podcast, Zoom Off, Mark Zoom Off, yeah, right? Yeah, Zoom. Yeah, and yeah. he had a dude on there. I don't even know who dude was, but he dude was spitting. Like, he was – pause. He was – um. Dude had some really facts. He was like, Iguodala didn't move like he was like Kobe, but he didn't he didn't move like Kobe. And he was like, but one thing about him, whenever he got mad, he, I would just say he got mad and he would just go dunk on everybody. And I was like, damn, he was really watching. Like I, it was a point in my career where I was just like, man, move, man, I'm about to just dunk on y'all. Like yeah. it's nothing you can do. So you cuffed that bad, Paul. <laughs> Terrence Williams. Yeah, yeah. And so that was one. Um, and then, uh, About oh, the I had a good one on uh, my teammate, too. And he's the GM of Denver Nuggets right now, Calvin Booth. Calvin Booth threw a bad outlet pass, and uh, Rodney Rogers stole it from him. And he handed it to me. And I, that was my first, like, like boom, that was my rookie year. And then one of my favorite ones, though, is, is KG and Paul Pierce. They yeah, always that, talking always crazy. Talk- they always talking crazy. Yeah. And I think Rondo, I had the ball in my right hand, and Rondo came across me, and I like, this is before you were like bumping guys, stepping through them, and Rondo came, and he, I bumped him like, move, and the ball was rocking. I had like a one, two, and KG was still in my, like Rondo ran through me. KG was on my right, and Paul was on my left. KG jumped, and I just took off, and I'm looking at both of them like, boom, and I was, I was just like, yeah, suckers, because that's the energy they be having oh, no, for when sure. you're playing against yeah. them. And so that was that was one. Of, every time I see that, I was like, "Oh, I forgot about that one." But it's it's a few. Uh, so you, we spoke a few times. You going to one of few people have gone to six consecutive NBA Finals. Mm-hmm. So you played in a lot of playoff games, a lot of playoff series. What do you, what are a few series that you remember the most that are your favorite? Uh, the series that are my favorites um, are the first time getting out the first round, obviously. Who was that? Uh, Chicago. Damn, that was your first time getting out the first round. Yeah, like we, we and fam, <laughs> before <laughs> before, <laughs> before you this got to Philly, was <laughs> before you got to Philly, round. bro, we weren't even supposed to go to the playoffs. Bro, I know, I didn't know that was damn. We was crazy. we were successful getting to the playoffs because we weren't supposed to get there. Like we wasn't like now. You know, I always say like you don't know the league until you go somewhere else. Yeah. Bro, we wasn't trying to go to the playoffs. That's <laughs> Philly, please shut the hell up then, bro. So y'all, so y'all, the process, y'all didn't make it. 
<laughs> past the second when we went. And then before that, y'all went to the first for 20 some years? That's crazy. Yeah, like 2001, they went to the finals. Right, and then after that, like, yeah, like, bro, we, they, we weren't supposed to go to the playoffs. No we was just getting there. why you jumped on the scoreboard that night. Yeah, bro, that was the first time. Oh, when we went outside, everybody was so hype. I didn't know why they were so hype. I'm like, oh, I know we won a series, but that was yeah, the first bro. time in years. Wow. Yeah, so that one. <laughs> But then the next series, too, was one of my favorite ones. Boston. That was a good series. Because yeah, my first, series. that's the first time playing in seven game series. I feel like we played great. Like we right. played some ball. We played some ball. And, we and had, this was, if we had that young, we would <laughs> we would have won that no, series. No, this was this yeah. was this was like you would have thought the big three with Rondo, the big four. You would have thought they won four or five championships. Yeah. The way they talk about it, yeah. you know. And I'm a huge fan. Like Paul Pierce, like. People don't like Paul, but I love like I, I rock with Paul too. Pierce heavy, and so the, those two series, and then um, obviously, uh, obviously the finals, the first finals, two thousand fifteen, um, the OKC, the OKC when when we were down three one. Why'd you like that so much? Because like I always say this, I thought they were the best team in the league. Me too. Like they had Russ, they had Katie, they had Serge. Um, they had Steven Adams, and uh, I'm forgetting somebody. And, and Pauls, they were, bro, they were huge. That's what I'm saying. Like, they, they were just like a big, like, yeah. they looked like an NBA yeah. team. Like Perry like, Jones was, might have been on that team. Yeah, it was like everybody's 6'10", uh, uh, along with KD. Um, um, Anthony Murrow could shoot the ball. Collison was out there doing his thing. Like, I'm forgetting somebody, too. Deion Waiters was like Deion the Waiters, like, Deion yeah, Waiters bro. on the team. Yeah. Um, was uh, Reggie Jackson on that squad, or did he get traded already? I think Reggie might have been traded. Bro, that, that lineup was Detroit. so yeah. crazy. Oh, no, I'm tripping. Andre Roberson was Russ. like one of the top defenders in yeah, the league. So, nine, yeah. yeah, you had Russ six four. Then you had Roberson six eight. You had KD seven feet. You had Serge seven feet. You had uh, uh, Adam seven feet. Bro, that was the biggest lineup I ever played against. You had KD on the other side, which is an understatement. Mm -hmm. It was pound, like by far. Steph is unreal, but KD is is it, it, alone enough is a problem. Yeah. yeah, and so coming back the way we did, like that was one of my favorite series. And <laughs> like having big moments that nobody saw, like I, I really love those games where it's like I'm making plays, but like nobody knows it. But like this is like Steve Kerr and I having like, that's when he like, he geeking out. He was like, man, you were great tonight. Like, and then we having that understanding. Mm. So when you went through that 3-1 and came back and we had a conversation about being down, it wasn't nothing but being down 2-1 on the road. Is that why you're so comfortable? Or were you down three? Comfortable and confident versus oh, Celtics? Yeah. Back yeah, in 2022 yeah, yeah, yeah. finals, we had a conversation. It was just like, bro, I think yeah. it's over, dog. In 2015, we were down 2-1. Yeah. And I'm telling Clark, my man Clark Miyazaki, I'm, t I'm like, Clark, we about to come back and win this series. He was like, what? I'm like, bro, we found it. Like, bro, I'm about to go crazy. Like, I'm Where's telling him, like, yeah. and so – Oh, and then my uh, – that was against uh, Cleveland, 2015. Y'all was down 2-1 We were down 2-1 versus, versus Cleveland. Yeah, people forget that. Bro, I didn't – oh, because Della Dadova. <laughs> Damn, G. Uh, they were about to make a sandwich after him. If they would have won, that's 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 one thing in NBA history I'm upset about. Della Dadova. He not. ain't the only one yeah. like that. Yeah. But uh, then my, my other series was uh, playing against the Warriors. That was my best statistical playoff series, the Warriors when I was in Denver. Cause I was giving them hell, but this was Steph and Clay coming. This was Steph coming out to party, and we just couldn't do nothing about it. But um, yeah, that's what gave me confidence, and that's what gave me confidence. In the period. Like I'm knowing, like all right, we gonna win, or I'm knowing, like uh, we don't, we don't, we ain't, we ain't gonna win. Like I, like in the, the Lakers series last year, I'm like, it ain't looking good. Sack sack wasn't looking good. Steph had to go get fifty. Uh -huh. And so you kind of just get that feeling like you know how things are going to go based on like everything, based on seeing your teammates, the, the energy, the other team, just like how the flow is going. Like you, you kind of see that uh, with that experience. Uh, so during that time, who who were some of your favorite players that you played, or like most under top five players that you played? I always tell people that Manu Ginobili was so underrated. At least for me, you probably don't think so. But I like who shocked you when some, you showed up? I had some chippy interactions with Manu, so yeah. I, I don't give him the credit he deserves. He was buddy was nice, but top five, I got six. My yeah. favorite guys. I expected six. So I'm not. I'm not gonna ask Steph. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna ask Steph. All right. So it's Kobe, uh, Melo, Katie, LeBron, and the fifth is a tie. Paul Pierce and Kyrie. Ooh, snap word. Yeah. 
Like Paul Pierce was I like, like that. I like yeah. that. I like that. Yeah. That's crazy. None of them got none of them really got like like none of them really have like they have all had their flaws. Like you can you know, people try to say mellow defensive flaws or whatever, but man, Mel Mello was uh, who's a better scorer, Mello or Katie? I'm saying when you got done playing against Mello. I'm a be, this 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 is what I say with KD. Katie. Katie's unbelievable. Don't, don't let me get fucked up. And I kind of knew that. Nobody really took there's so many conversations around Mello that like when I seen us play versus you, like him you guard him for the first time when I was a rookie, I'm like, bro, Mello might be the best scorer in the league by far. And then like when he kept going overseas and breaking all those records, like for FIBA, I'm like, we're not talking about this, but they didn't put him fifth fiddle, and he's still the best scorer. And then when it came to – bro, the one time he ran the same three plays on you, he had nine points. His shot was so quick, dog. It was in the, in the hand for like a tenth of a second combined. And I'm there. And he's 6'8", 260, yeah. dog. Like a human shouldn't be moving. We went to that timeout, remember? Doug was like, Dre, do you want help? And I remember you going crazy like, I'm a motherfucking man. I don't need help from nobody. Don't fucking ever bring that to me, bro. And Doug was being petty, but I'm like, well, shit, who gonna help him? I know I ain't gonna stop this. <laughs> but I'm yeah, not Doug being stop petty. Yeah, like, <laughs> you want help? I'm like, who gonna guard this man? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, my father doing that, but yeah. No, people, no, you yeah, should do it. Like, yeah, Mello, people need to know that. Yeah, Mello. Now, now KD is unbelievable. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying, like, when you break down Mello, it's like, buddy, 6'8", 260. Like, his feet are quick. He's out of shape. His jumper's fast. His handle's dumb. He imposed Like, where did they find this man at? Yeah, we man. talk about, like, LeBron being a specimen, but, like, where did they find yeah. Melo at? Melo, Melo just it was – now, KD, I would say KD is a better scorer. He's seven feet tall. You can't get to him. Like, I can – the one thing about KD is I I have something that I, is in my advantage. I know what I can do to guard KD. What is it? I can keep KD from getting the ball. Oh, <laughs> like I can deny him. No, you're right. No, I didn't. and and that's saying how good he is. The only you can't score because you ain't got the ball. Mm. Other than that, I'm dead. Mm. That's how good KD is with Melo. After the game, I'm like, man, I need a whole ice bath, like mm. neck down. Like I can do ice bath from waist down, but like after Melo, I'm like, bro, I need a massage. I need an ice bag. Like I need like eight nine hours of sleep. Like you going you going home bruised, guarding this man. Like he beating you up. I'm like, how you beat me up and you got the ball? That's how good Melo was. So we talk about since we're all underrated. Who are some of the most underrated players you went up against? Where you like, bro? Every single night was ISO Joe. Was it low key? People forget how good Josh Smith was. Low key, Josh you Smith. know he's an idiot. Yeah. But like, <laughs> he could, I'm, it's funny. No, but he could dab. I remember yeah. showing up being like, bro, yeah. he must be a really yeah. like coaches must hate him because there's no reason why he shouldn't be an all star literally every year, bro. He want to get voted in on like Josh Smith had some nights on me too. Uh oh okay hold on I'm wrote because I wrote this down this one was tough yeah. okay I got this one I got this one five underrated guys number one and it's number one it's not even close really ah uh, the other guy's not really underrated but he's so good that I still think he's underrated so Joe Johnson is number one like Joe Johnson was like one of the like he was like mellow he's one of the first guys that like he. He gave me a damn heart attack. Like yeah. he knocked the wind out of my chest. Yeah. Like he hit me right here and I dropped. Like, <gasps> like I ain't never lost my breath guarding somebody. Um, and we had some really I had some good games versus Atlanta because like I, you know, they were saying like I go to sleep for Steph. Like yeah. I get some rest. Like I got some rest for Joe. Like, okay. Uh, me and Joe gotta see me tomorrow. Yeah. But no, I know fans don't understand how good, how Joe, good is. Joe is. Or the uh, old NBA where they're going to keep running that same play and abuse over you and over and, and, and over. over. And Joe was 252. Yes, so. bro. And, and yeah, so Joe was one. Um, how could I keep forgetting his name? Nets guard went to Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, Devin Harris. Devin Harris had – he was one of the few players that had a move I could not stop. The pullback? Bro, he would go so fast at you and pull back, snatch back yeah. between. Um, shoot. And I could, I'm like, why can't I get to this? Like, mm. same cadence, but he'll he'll go hard and keep going too. Yeah. So you gotta respect yeah. the speed. He was so quick. Devin Harris is one of those guys that was like, bro, he gave me fits. Yeah. He gave me fits. Um, Evan Turner was another guy. 
um, when practicing up against him going one on one, I'm like, oh, this kid is a bucket. Man, you put me six. Man, we so just not more. we just not putting him in the right position, mm. right? Like I know basketball. Like I told a guy, like Evan Turner, if Evan Turner plays well tonight, he gonna beat us. And the guy be like, I don't really know. I know that's your guy, and Evan Turner beat us that night. Like I, yeah, I know basketball. Um, so ET's up there. Uh, Gilbert Arenas was different, man. Like Gilbert was agent zero, but I'm like, I just found out that Gilbert is only two years older than me. Bro, when he said the other day when he got hurt at like 24, 25, so you weren't even in your prime. Your career is basically over with a knee injury, and you had three sixties. I had no for 60 idea. Point games I had versus no Kobe, idea bro. He was, that Gilbert was only two years older than me, bro. So, so Gilbert was doing it at 24, yeah. 23. So then he was wilding. He was really supposed to be wild. He was wilding because he's the baby, bro. Nobody even spoke on. It. I didn't even know. Gil I thought Gilbert's like thirty two years old, killing these. That's dudes, what I bro. thought. That's a, that's one story, bro. That should be spoke on more. Gilbert was a kid doing that. Bro. Gilbert was. So so good and he was like out there playing around like toying with people yeah, he said i was only a year older than brian that's what he said i had no clue bro Gilbert was yeah it's like oh my god you never told me that bro i didn't know that i didn't know that because he was in arizona way before me he went to arizona at 17. so nobody's putting two and two together that this kid is supposed to be in high school when he at arizona killing Right, bro. And then he goes slip in the second round because he being childish. I'm like, he just look at his that, age. Yeah, he burnt up that park. He burnt up the park. He was really, <laughs> he was still a kid then. Like Gilbert was different. And then um Oh. Now this is one of my favorite players, period. And shout out to uh I'm gonna talk to I talked to Candace Parker. Uh we got a meeting soon. We got a Zoom on uh, some business stuff. But uh I compared Candace Parker to this guy and people took it as offensive. And I'm like, if y'all knew how good this dude was, Ooh. Lamar Odom. Was so nice. Lamar Odom was one of the best players in the NBA. Like in terms of like hooping, yeah. and he had that. He had one. He had like two or three great years in the NBA. One with Miami because he was down in Miami. One three five. And they got him right. Yeah. And I talked to this guy about that. He was like, "Yeah, Pat put his ass to work. Like yeah. that was L O L O." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was the he was six eleven like point guard. He point, point four, dog. So you should be standing right there. Yes, we got to go find Lamar. Yeah. Like Lamar Odom was so nice. And then um, I saw him at his best one night against us. And Doug had me guarding him. I'm like, why am I guarding Lamar Odom? Bro, I couldn't do nothing. It was like guarding Yao Ming. Yeah, he was this tall. He just turned around laying up. I'm like, bro, I, I can't strip him because he he knows like he knows that and he just he the ball up here. Like he got fundamentals, he got handles, he put no I use his body. And then we played together in the uh, 2010 FIBA uh World Championships too. And so I got a chance to play with him. I'm like, okay, that's your problem, LO. You be goofing off. But Lamar Odom was so nice. Like he went hooping this summer, and so we showed up to FIBA. He was like, "Man, it's my first day hooping." I'm like, "Bro, you ain't even getting ready for this. You ain't using a new ball. This is a, this ball different." <laughs> he was like, "No, nah, son, son, I'm just hooping." And then we got to spend some time interact. Like I rocks with him heavy. Lamar yeah. Odom was so nice. He was one of the best players in the league. Yeah. You told me he's originally like just cool dude. I cool used to dude. always hear in LA they said cool. Kobe was a man, but they said L LO ran LA. Yes. All right. So during this time, you played four decades or two decades basically. Mm -hmm. So. Obviously, off the court, you had a lot of stuff you want to do. What were some of your favorite albums during this time? Oh. You're huge in the music. Was there, like, say every five years, was there, like, an album where you're like, this was this fit this phase, this fit that phase? Like, what? Yeah, so as, one, as I start with, like, number five is Sneaky. So Fabulous and his mixtapes. Uh, so Funeral Service, Fab was moving different. And he was dropping mixtapes left and right. And was this back is, in the day when he was really broke. This is when I was really listening to, like I, I had to like get my mind right going to games because you know, the environment that I was in. And uh, so this is like 2008-ish, nine-ish. Uh, what was the name of those mixtapes? Uh, there's no competition. Oh, he spelled his name different, so I gotta spell it different. F-A-B-O. There's no competition? The soul tapes. Not the soul tapes. There is no competition. Where, where, there is no competition. Was the ones too? Yeah, those were kind of earlier. Yeah, soul yeah, tape yeah, came yeah, like 2012, yeah, 2013. Yeah, yeah. So there is no competition. Two and three was really good. Um, so yeah, I was. Uh, that was that was one phase because uh, I was big J Electronica fan and uh, Fabulous had did a mixtape. I mean, did one of those songs. Um, so I would say that one. Uh, Watch the throne was the lockout. 
Watch yeah. the Throne was I saw big. You at that concert. Yeah. yeah, Watch the Throne was big for me. Um, seeing Jay and Kanye come together because you had like big album release moments back then. Yeah. Now they just they just drop, yeah. and you don't get to experience them like you be were used to be able to. And so uh, Watch the Throne was a big one. Um, Blonde. Yeah. Blonde. <laughs> Blonde. Frank Ocean's Blonde was one of my favorite albums because I was getting older. Yeah. And so I was kind of chilling out, mellowing out. Like I was thinking the game. I like, I didn't have to get like up for a game. Yeah. I was just like it was like playing chess. So I just like my mood was like very even keel. Like you can feel all types of emotions up, down, whatever. So I'm reading my teammates just off like getting in tune with myself going to the game. So like uh I'm a huge Frank Ocean fan. So I was listening to Blonde a lot. Uh and then uh obviously uh to Pimp a Butterfly might be one of my favorite albums of all time. It's a, t- it's a tie. To Pimp a Butterfly had me geeked. Like, I was ready to kill people around that. I shouldn't say that. But I felt a certain type of way listening to Pimp a Butterfly. Like, it spoke to me. Like, it's who I am. And then uh, The Life of Pablo. Uh. The Life of Pablo. Um, big Kanye fan. I don't know if I can say that, but. Uh. Uh, your first Christmas game where Ye-, Ye was there back in Denver. What was some of your favorite uh, Christmas games or the most memorable ones? Because once you uh, left Philly, they started getting on. Every year, right? <laughs> every year, yeah. I was, I was like, dang, I play Christmas every year after I left Philly. Legit. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Denver one, that was my first one. We lost that game too. Um, but uh, that was interesting. You know, you know, George is George. Um I had a solid game though, I think. No, we played the Clippers. We played the Clippers. And uh Jamal Crawford hit Andre Miller with the behind the back, behind the back. Uh so that was crazy. That was Lob City too. That was like the right at the beginning of Lob City. Um so that was cool because it's the first one. But then I realized like I don't really like Christmas games. Like it's just it's not really Christmas. Um and then the next year my first Warriors Christmas game. Now that was dope and memorable because like that's when I learned like what a great organization is. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not real. saying what a bad organization is. Oh no 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 is. no, but it's a I'm tr- saying no, what, what a great organization is. Yeah, but what you said earlier like when you leave Philly it's Christmas games all the time. It's like a summary when you leave Philly it's Christmas. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Tell but I just had a game in Denver yeah. on Christmas and then the next year I go to the Warriors yeah. and then we played the Clippers again in LA I'm gonna start. for Christmas. And I just remember walking in the shout out to my man E, Eric Housen, right? Like he should have his jersey retired for real. I'm being serious. And when I walked into my room, family with me. So it's the first time the family came yeah. with me. So my wife and my son, it's like a Christmas tree in the room, decorated. Then they had gifts under the tree. So my son had a jersey with his name on it, Warriors jersey. My wife had stuff. They had gifts. I'm like, oh, this is a great organization. Like E had everybody room decked out. I'm like, I never seen that before. And so, like, small stuff goes a long way. That's what I learned. And I don't even know if we won the game, but, like, it felt like no, that's felt like Christmas, man. It was dope. Yeah. It no, was dope. That's amazing. What's his name? Eric Housen. Like, he the man. That's the equipment manager? Yeah. I like, remember, he do everything. I remember Darrell Wright showed up uh, to Sixers, and he always get mad at Rigo. And he's like, man, it would never be like this in Warriors. I'm like, bro, Rigo's a man, G. Like, <laughs> What you can't get off him from Gary, he's going to make up for it in the streets. Like, that's it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, call it a day. All right, so I said it before. You played two decades in the NBA. You played versus a lot of great teams and everything. So we we should move on next and do what we do, basically. And, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you a question where you we're going to compare, analyze, and mm-hmm. then make people mad. So cool. during like this that. time – since you entered the league, there's a lot of great teams, a lot of great, uh, mm-hmm. great franchises, and everything. What era was the toughest to play in? Because when you first walked in, you said this is the old Pistons, so with Chauncey, yeah. Rip Hamilton, Tayshawn Prince, who Rasheed Wallace, and all those guys. Ben Wallace, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were just, they were just really good at what they do. Those are the toughest teams to go against like they going you can't alter how they play they're just going to do what they do and the Pistons team might have been one of the toughest teams to play against like you know how there's change of speeds in the game slow fast fast slow but when the Pistons when you played them you just feel like you just were moving so fast because they were just like everywhere I just like I'm trying to get rid of y'all 
and Rasheed can guard on perimeter, Ben Wallace can guard on perimeter, and then you couldn't go in the paint because you was going to get elbowed by, sharp elbow by Ben Wallace. You got to get hit by screens coming off that. They ran one play. They ran floppy over and over and over, and it was Rip coming off, and Rip wouldn't miss. He was he, – I was – underrated guys like he was one of the most underrated players in the league like Kobe was chasing that man around couldn't do nothing in the 2004 yeah. NBA finals like, that's the same yeah that same yeah, team that knocked out yeah, yeah, Lakers, yeah he dynasty. knocked out the Lakers dynasty yeah they were trying Chaun- to repeat or something I always say Chauncey was better than Steve Nash people get mad it's just Chauncey was really different like Chauncey was different man Chauncey had no flaws like ask AI about Chauncey he li- he had AI with one of them crosses. AI left the screen. Like yeah, Chauncey six, was four, post work, and he had a burner. Yeah. And then Tayshawn was just like the epitome of a role player. Like, but an excellent role player. He gonna knock down wide open shots. You look up, Chauncey got thirteen points on six attempts. He efficient, getting stops, guarding everybody. Right before the big shot. Yeah, and yeah. so. Uh, the hardest era, though, because huh. during that era, during your time in the league, I believe it's like the Pistons that had him run. Obviously, San yeah. San Antonio always has one. Lakers won two championships. Yeah, Lakers. The were, Celtics yeah, were pretty dominant yeah, with the big three. Well, it, it, I should say this. And the Heat had two with LeBron. The so, Heat, the and Heat. And then y'all went on with y'all yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then Cleveland Cavaliers. I can't. Uh, so during that time, we think probably about the had the, like. I feel like we had the best team. Out of all that, out of all those years I've been in the league, we had the best team. Like the Warriors. Um, yeah, but uh, the Lakers team, Kobe was like, man, Kobe, they were good, man. That triangle was really hard to guard. And when Paul Gasol and Bynum were healthy, bro, they were a problem. Yeah. That's why the Celtics couldn't beat them. Like, Bynum was really the difference maker. Yeah. When they lost to the Celtics, Bynum wasn't there. And then when they beat the Celtics, Bynum was punishing them on the glass. And then L.O. was L.O. That's seven foot, seven foot, six eleven. LO at the three, <laughs> right? It's crazy, um, and that the, they they were just so efficient. Like I, I've considered like the Spurs like a Euro team, and it's that American pride or whatever we call ourselves over here. That pride, like I don't want to give them that credit, but I love Tim Duncan. But Tony Parker, I feel like could be underrated because Tony Parker were so Tony Parker was so unassuming. Yeah. I'm just like, buddy can't shoot. He got that weak ass right, right over top. the top yeah. crossover. Like, bro, and, and I'm a defender, so he ain't getting me with it. But even when I'm guarding, I'm like, oh, buddy is quick, man. He keep getting the scoop shot. He's just awkward angles, and then they like a machine. They like a machine. Like, they have a wide open shot and pass it up for a wide open shot that they'll pass up for another wide open shot just to make the defense move. And it just mm-hmm. got annoying, and we just – we couldn't beat them. Mm-hmm. And then going into, into San Antonio, it's like, bro, we are not going to win tonight. Like, they were just a machine. So I got, I do got respect for them. And then Manu was always hitting big shots. Bonner was always making like four threes a game. Yeah, I'm like, this really? weak ass white dude in <laughs> these new balances. This is when new balances wasn't cool. Yeah. I'm like, bro, if, the new, if new balance make one more shot, like, I used to be pissed. Uh, Francisco Elson, just like, bro, you know, certain guys, you'd be like, bro, if you wasn't on this team, you wouldn't be in the league. They had all them guys. They had all those guys who would get like they would be very effective, and they would be NBA players on that team. And it's like, bro, how did he get twenty tonight? Like uh, the the shooter from the small school. He left and went to Milwaukee, got a big deal, and then we didn't hear from him for a while. Oh, what's oh yeah, Gary Neal. Gary Neal. Yeah. Gary Neal was one of those guys. Francisco yeah. Elson was yeah, one of those sure. guys. Uh, uh, the other dude, Alberto. The big, the other yeah, big dude, Ar- 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 yeah, he was yeah. cooking. Yeah, it was just like what? Uh, um, oh yeah, the other dude too, Jones, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Brown, Brown, not Bobby, Other, yeah, yeah. Brown, Brown was killing. He had like a three year run. He was cooking. Yeah, um, was Spurs, and, uh, 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 my man that went to Virginia, oh, right, uh, Roger Mason, Mason Jr. Yeah, Roger, Roger Mason yeah. Jr. was cooking, fan. He led the league at three point. No, low key, no, but, oh, like for three God. or four, and and in DC he was cooking like. Bro, he was hitting threes, he bro. Was hitting, bro, yeah, bro, yeah. bro you, I'm naming all these dudes as like they are afterthoughts, bro. But they had a, they had a, they was they were strength in numbers before us, yeah. bro. They was cooking, they was cooking. So I, that was way different from a standpoint of like when you fast forward when I, when I came into the league and it was like the takeover of the Heat. Yeah, and yeah. things kind of changed in that sense where games were going kind of from what 95 points and four, 12 threes mostly to when you guys got it cracking and, and jumping up. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the Spurs still had it going. Um, 
Um, Dallas had a good team, though. I, I, I don't want to forget about Dallas. It felt like we couldn't beat Dallas at all. Um, Dallas had a tough squad. Dirk was Dirk. I like Dirk. Dirk, one of the few Europeans where I'm like, I hold him in like the same regard as Larry Bird. Like, I don't even know. Like, I was just telling somebody this. <laughs> I was telling somebody this. You talk about high moments, cut this out, cut the high moments out. You talking about you be thinking of some shit when you high? Fam, Larry Bird was so good that he beat his own genes. <laughs> right. You got to say that, bro. Get that back on, bro. Because that's fucking crazy. L- Larry Bird Bro, was so good again. that he defied his own odds. He beat his own gene pool. Like, if you think about how our body makeups are, certain races and demographics don't move a certain way. Yeah. Like, these these are what they're telling us. Like, yeah. we're not supposed to be that smart. We can't yeah. play quarterback. Like, I'm going yeah, off. Black people aren't smart. I'm going off their formula. Science, yeah. Larry Bird was not supposed to be that good. The man was like... He didn't even really work out like that. He just hooped. So yeah. he he lift weights. You know what I'm saying? Look at the shoes like, he's playing with. Yeah, his five, body, the way his body was shaped, the way his body was put together. Bro, he was cooking dudes. Night, he scored 40 with his left hand, and, and his right hand was working. He was like, I'm going to use my right hand next week. I'm going to use my left hand tonight. I don't know anybody that could do that ever in NBA history. Like Larry Bird was so good. I've been trying to get that off for so long. Like Larry Bird, like. Larry Bird might be in my top five. Like, Larry Bird was really – and he's white. And so that – I'm telling you, like, Larry Bird is amazing. Dirk was like that. Mm. Dirk, Dirk was like that. And so that team was good. But uh, yeah, KD is just a cheat code. And so – and then Steph is just like – So that 2017 was your favorite team ever? You ever played on or what? When you mean by favorite team, what do you mean? Was it – do you – Cause my Sixers team is one of my favorite teams, just because like I, I mean, I'm just tight with that's my guy. I mean, an argument of this debate of since you came into the league, not so much like uh, oh best team, like, like best team. Let's just say yeah, best yeah, team, yeah, like yeah, the best yeah, team ever. Yeah, yeah, because Clay don't miss, Clay don't miss. KD was just unfair. Um, Steph is really unfair. We, 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 I've been trying to tell people that now they know it. And then, um, I think me and Draymond's. Um, the way we we anchored the defense, the way he anchored the defense, and then the way that just our chemistry was with passing and getting him to rock, but also being threats at the same time. Like we really, we saw every look you can possibly see. They leaving me wide open. They leaving Draymond wide open. Like they going double teaming somebody else when I had the ball. Like, and and it was like we still got to an answer for it. Like there's nothing you're going to do. Like this is impossible. We can't lose. That's all I had. You got any anything else you want to say? You're already going to say your farewell elsewhere, but yeah. Uh, shout out to the streets. I think for me, the biggest thing was just like uh, the respect for my peers. I think that's what like solidified my career. Like all the other stuff really don't matter. Like you said, you talk about like all-star games. It was like, whatever, man. I don't even care anymore or, or defensive teams or accolades or, you know, people ask me, do I think I'm going to reach a certain status? I do think there should be tears in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I do think there should be tears. And you think how many and, and, and that'll stop them from yeah. comparing like LeBron, Kobe, MJ. Like yeah. you put, they get in this tier, you can't compare them because like they're just they're yeah. they're way over there. That's and right. then like you got you got you got someone that kind of probably should get in, and they deserve to be in. But like they they deserve to be in a, another another realm. Um, but I think just you know hearing some compliments from some of those guys like Melo will always say funny stuff like bro you always getting these deflections man stop bro you getting annoying like things like that and the respect I got from my peers like that that's what meant most to me and the rest of y'all can kiss my ass there we go